What is up booktube? It is Monty and today I'm back again once again with the start of another video and by the title, by the thumbnail, you know that I will be reading Empire of the Vampire by Jay Kristoff. I do feel as though I do need to acknowledge that Jay Kristoff has harmed a lot of people. So like Jay Kristoff has like fucked over large swathes of the internet with his like fuckery. So it is very questionable for me to have decided to go out and read the book. But um, I am interested in a vampire epic. Like the premise of like a vampire epic does intrigue me. And sure, Anne Rice is right there. But also like, let's let's not act as though Anne Rice is not also like a controversial figure. So I think what, what, what really... The reason that that my last reading vlog, the one where I read Act Cool, They'll Never Catch Us, and Heartbreakers and Fakers, became this 24-hour read like reading vibe thing was in part because of me wanting to read Empire of the Vampire. And I will say that because I knew Jay Kristoff was a questionable person, um, there was a part of me that was like, you know, I could just read it, not add it to my Goodreads, act as though I didn't buy it, um, just like hide it essentially. But one, I'm a vain person and I, I don't like the idea of not putting it on my Goodreads. Like I'm just, I, d I just want to have put it on my Goodreads essentially. But also I didn't like this idea that I was just going to like lie to the audience. Maybe I'm gonna read this and the book will be so horrible that I put myself through this um, for nothing. But we're here, we're gonna do the thing. I'm gonna pass this off to the Monty, the version of me that has read something that is going to talk to you guys about it. Um, and uh, we're gonna go from there. I am currently at 10% of Empire of the Vampire, so I'm coming back. So two things I'm learning from this. One thing that I've learned is I don't think that Jay Kristoff is an author that I need to go out and read everything of. Like the first trilogy I was never going to read because that's, never gonna read that. Never Night was probably never gonna read, but also after hearing this audiobook, I'm feeling no real desire to go out and do that. So, hate that for the culture. I am struggling a little, because I have read, um, I read, I think I've read, yeah, I did Gemini and Illuminae, both didn't like, but that was like mixed media. You had Amy Kaufman in there. It feels a little sus to judge Jay Kristoff from that. But here, him flying solo, adult work, I don't think he's hitting it on, he's not hitting it for me. So the structure of this is that we have Gabriel, who is a silver saint, which means that he is half vampire, half human, spoiler alert. But we also learned that in the first 10%, so like how much of a spoiler is it? I don't know, but that's what the silver saints are. They're these people who are half vampire, half human. They are only ever men. And allegedly, so I feel like that's gonna come up in this trilogy. So they're only ever men, and they all take a vow of celibacy, which I also think is gonna come into play because as soon as we found out that, we found out that Gabriel really wanted to fuck this nun lady, so I'm pretty sure they're gonna fuck. But, so he's a silver saint. It's been like 27 years or whatever the flap says where vampires have inherited the earth. There is a really big, like, heavy emphasis on Christianity, which is weird to me a little bit, which I also found in The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson that I read a couple of weeks ago at this point. Uh, like, the in-universe text, The Way of Kings, which was supposed to be, like, this grand, like, I'm gonna call it a Bible, but when I say Bible, I mean that in, like, you might have a study Bible or something, like a text of rules or things, right? A code book, mayhaps, I don't know, like a guidebook. I was interrupted by a call from a boss, but here we go. Uh, where was I? The Knights reading into the Bible, Bible. So there's a heavy, like really religious tone to this, which is weird to me. It also feels like vaguely, vaguely French, like vaguely French, vaguely maybe even Italian. I don't know, it's weird. 
because it's also set on Earth, because they keep, call, like, they definitely called it Earth. There's definitely a reference to the meek inheriting the Earth. But I feel like this is supposed to be, like, an alter, it's like an alternate history. Well, obviously, because there's vampires. But, like, I don't, it's weird. It's, I'm gonna have to look at, at my physical copy to see if, like, this is actually set somewhere that, like, I'm supposed to know. Because I definitely didn't think it was. So we have all of that going on, but he, Gabriel, our silver saint, has been captured. We know that he has killed the forever king, and the new ruler sends a historian to gather his life story, which I have to say, this historian is not doing a very good job, because Gabriel attempts to, like, launch into the story, and the historian dude is like, no, bitch, that's not where the story starts. I need to go to the beginning. But we kind of breeze past that, I think, like, we kind of, we definitely breeze past, like, there's only so much you're going to remember about your childhood, so, like, on one hand, I get it, but also, like, give it to us. So, we see the cloud, like, we see, like, the sun go out. I'm gonna call it go out, but, like, the sun still exists. The sun is still there. It's just, one, not as bright, and two, there seems to be, like, some kind of clouds. But, like, it's definitely not, like, the sun supernova in the winter. Like, the way that this is explained is a little strange to me because I'm also having really hard, to, I don't know, maybe I'm trying to get too scientific with it. I'm just gonna like, let it be, let it be. But I'm like, how, like, it's been 27 years and you guys are like, what are you doing? Like, what kind of plants are you growing where you can barely see the sun? How are you all not vitamin D deficient? You know what I mean? Like, I'm just a little confused and kerfuffled. So maybe I'll have to like go on YouTube and try and like suss out the vibe. I mean, it's not like there haven't been catastrophes in our own earth and timeline with like super volcanoes and things and like the sun not being it like you know like I, I get it and clearly clearly plant life survived and shit because we all are eating now but i'm just like how are you all not dead it's like what are y'all doing what's the secret i would like to know fill me in but we get to the scene where his sister is like turned into a vampire and like he has to fight her off and hold her back and and then the funeral like the town folk in the village don't give her a proper burial and then we get another scene, like it flashes forward. He's like, I don't know, 14, 15 maybe. Uh, and he is like coming into puberty and he's low key hooking up with the daughter of the preacher man because it's white people mess. So of course he's trying to fuck the daughter of the preacher man. Um, and when he's eating her out, he's talking about tasting blood and shit. And I'm like, sir, um, I don't think you're supposed to be, like maybe, maybe, I don't know. I've never had the opera like I just have it so what do I know but it's like if you are thinking to yourself it tastes like copper and rust and iron I think you are I think she's bleeding and so that's when we discover that he is like low-key feeding on her while eating her out um is not the best sentence I've constructed on my channel but that's essentially what's happening um and that's when we learn that he is a well we don't know then we just know he's doing something weird and he's freaking out and the audience is freaking out and the townsfolk are definitely freaking out because now sister girl just thought she was, you know, gonna get fucked and she might be dying. And so she's screaming out and her daddy, the preacher man comes in and then, you know, Gabriel runs away and the, the townsfolk come angrily, but it's okay because the silver saints are on the scene and they're like, we want this man. And it seems that nobody knows that the silver saints are half vampire, half human because they're like why do you want them and the silver saints seem to be definitely revered in this little community so like i guess the the common people just view them as this ultra religious order of knights that like kill vampires that they don't know that those people are part vampire i do want to say that i do think that it is one i think it's weird that vampire men can still have children because that's weird. You definitely still need to have a, a working circulatory system for all of that to work. Like, I'm like, you just, you have to be alive for all of that to work. For all of what's happening, 
you need it to work. I understand that Stephanie Meyer has come out and was like, yeah, when they went into the warm waters of the ocean, it like rejuvenated Edward's testicles. But I don't think that's happening here. So for whatever reason, men can still ejaculate swimming like swimming sperm cells, but female vampires can't give birth, which to me, if one can do it, just make both do it. Just like give it to me, explain it that it's magic, they're magical creatures, do whatever you need to do. But I think it's weird. I think it's weird. I don't understand this. And one, I don't understand this like obsession with like vampire men need to like procreate. Why? Why? And I, but them being like a secret, like people not knowing that's what the Silver Saints are, that I can, I can understand. Um, I just didn't realize, didn't realize. But um, that's where I'm at so far. I definitely don't recommend you read this. I feel like because I haven't been doing as many skincare moments in the reading vlogs, I've just kind of doubled down on car clips, which I actually hate editing because I have to adjust the vo It's not that important. But I have read another 8%, so I'm now at 18-ish percent. I have no clue what number page that is in the book. It's over 100 pages at this point. I have started the second book in this, however many parts this thing is going to be. I'm on book two now, which I don't know how to feel about quite yet, if I'm being honest with you. So the first part of the book was we met our main character, Gabriel, who, according, I think Monet said this in their Goodreads review, was like, that's not really the main character, but that's who we're following right now. Um, so we have Gabriel. He found out he was one of the Silver Saints, which is like the child of a vampire and a human person. Then we found out that the, they, all of them, not all of them, but most of them have like a special gift. There are four families of vampires, which seems like a startlingly no, like startlingly low number. But I guess if you're just like, you can only reproduce by like turning humans or giving birth to silver saints, it doesn't matter there's only four of you. It feels like it should matter, but I guess it really doesn't. So, but Gabriel out here, who was like the last of the Silver Saints, the best of the Silver Saints, the Slayer of the Forever King, we found out that his vampiric daddy is like a nothing, a nobody. Be like his daddy was so young that the special gifts that you're supposed to get for being one of the Silver Saints, like related to these vampires, he didn't get in any of them. Like he has like the basic level shit, but he doesn't get any of like the fun magic shit that you get when you are the child of a vampire so we did that um there was th that, like, that was part of like this little trial moment and then the book kind of like jumps 17 years into the future and Gabriel is just kind of talking to the historian like trust me I know you're looking at me sideways because I'm jumping 17 years ahead but I know how to tell my story I kind of I don't like Gabriel I think that's that's number one and number two is I do not like how J. Kristoff crafts a narrative. I want to take a moment to talk about the world building elements of this situation. I don't want to do it while I'm in the car and like the lighting is going in and out and the audio is questionable. So I hope that like once I'm further into it, I'll be able to talk about it, but I actually hate it. Like it is, it is bothering my spirit how much I don't like some of the world building choices here. I didn't look at the map. I know I said I needed to, but one, I don't understand like why we have like all these fictitious kingdoms and bullshittery. We're still on earth. The Christian church is like central to the whole story. This book is like set in like 500 AD or not even 500 AD, but it's like set in like 1320, maybe 1618, like that kind of a vibe. No, there's pistols. So whenever the flintlock pistol came into, there's pistols here. But, so like they have gunpowder or the magical equivalent to make bullets come out the guns. But what's bothering me is like sometimes the characters say things that just feel, I don't know. Like maybe if I read some classical literature, I would find 
some of these same like sayings are more time timeless than I'm giving them credit for but sometimes it's usually Gabriel Gabriel in particular I'm just kind of like is that what people are saying that and then you have like this thing where it's fantasy so okay you can do whatever you want in a fantasy world but I still think that the reader has to has to believe that such a thing would be said by characters in this situation that you're claiming exists and for me I call bullshit like I'm actively calling bullshit I don't believe that it makes sense in the larger context of the world wildest drive the experience that I've ever had but I was trying to end the clip and then I remembered I wanted to talk about this little time jump situation so he's at the school situation that he's talking to their little historian who I think is probably at this point my the only character that I care about um because that's his information is not like I trust what the historian man is saying and I think that he is saying all of the little things that I would be saying if someone were telling me the story. He's giving me all the things that I want to know. He's far more talented than me, could not be sketching the things that he is sketching, but you know, that's not the point. So, we jump to the future and now we are 17 years into it. I don't think that at this point he had killed the Forever King yet, but maybe, I don't think he had, because I think he's in jail for killing the Forever King. So, I think we still got 10 years to go there. But we do have a 17 year time jump and he's in this little inn and he's doing things at the inn and I hate that for him. Kind of hate it for me too if I'm being honest because I don't think that it's like all that entertaining. But we have one of the, there's like these group of nuns that were at where the Silver Saints live and they're nothing special because of course you can only be a Silver Saint if you're a man something that's going to come back up. I also want to say that the Silver Saints are supposed to be celibate, and yet Gabriel is always referenced, I don't say always, but on multiple occasions, this man has like used sex, the pleasures of fucking, as kind of like, to explain how good something is supposed to feel. And I'm kind of like, aren't you supposed to be celibate? Like, how do you know what any of this is? Like, you're like you are literally just talking out of your ass or you broke your vow of celibacy which i think he did because i think he and astrid are totally fucking and i think that there is at some point in this trilogy going to be a female silver saint but that's neither here nor there um so that aside one of the nuns is now in this group of other people who are far more interesting than gabriel in my opinion there's this one girl who has like a mountain lion who like listens to the shit that she says then there's like this highborn lord person who has like white hair so you know he's going to be interesting because the moment a character has white hair they're going to do some powerful shit so i'm in, like i'm interested but i don't like the way that the narrative is not going to be told to me chronologically like to me i don't understand the i don't understand this i'm going to tell the man a story like it really is like Jay Kristoff saw Patrick Rothfuss out here and said, I'm going to steal this. And it's not that I think that a character telling another character their life story is inherently, like, trademarked by Patrick Rothfuss. But I do hope that at the end of Empire of the Vampire, Gabriel is dead, and the next two books in the series are about something else. Because I do think that if over three days we get this man's story, I do think that's, like... I'm not a Patrick Rothfuss stand, but if I was Patrick Rothfuss, I would be a little upset that someone else decided, like, I don't know. Maybe that's unreasonable for me to, to say that kind of a thing, but I would be upset. But that's all I have to say at this point. I'm almost home. I don't think I'm going to actually do any reading reading tonight because I just don't think that's what the Lord intends. So I will check in tomorrow when I've done some reading, probably in my car, probably after work. That seems to be where. I will say that this is not a book that I recommend reading on audio. I think that the narrator, I think when you have like deep, low voices, like you are just not, the Lord did not want you to narrate audiobook because I think that they are the kind of narrator that you definitely cannot speed up i cannot listen to this man any faster than the 1.5 i have him on which feels so slow but 
when I opened the book, like when I first got it from Libby, and it was automatically set to two, which is what I was listening to like the Way of Kings on earlier in the month. It was fine from Rocco Kramer and Kate Reading or Redding, however she pronounces that name. But um, for this man, his deep low voice, no, 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 couldn't do it. So I don't think he's a good audiobook narrator. It's kind of fucking me up a little. I've yet to import any of this footage into Premiere and I'm a little bit nervous to do so because <laughs> of, I think the first clip I did, I got interrupted with a phone call from my boss. And then yesterday the clip got interrupted by the Starbucks drive-through. So I don't know how coherent this vlog is, but I have managed to read a little bit more. I read the book physically for the first time, and I have to say that I'm still not impressed by how the book is bound. I'm actually a little, I'm actually a little nervous to read it physically because there are so, like the book is so thick that like the binding is already like not even attached to the spine, which the fuck. And it looks as though just reading it at page like 200 that the book is gonna like split. Like this feels very poorly produced. Maybe that's me being an American elitist because I got a UK copy, but like, I don't have these issues with books that are printed in America. I don't, I've never seen this happening. So I'm not impressed by that. Maybe when I'm at home, I'll like show you and maybe you guys will be like, Monty, you're overreacting. But I read it physically for the first time last night. I didn't read too much. I read like maybe a hundred pages. I finished part two. So that was the part where we were in the little, we had jumped 17 years. He had killed some people. They were, got to a location. And then part three, which is where I'm at now, we are going back in time. So remember, I don't know if I told you guys this, but I definitely told myself this. At the beginning of the book, we were definitely told that there are no female silver saints. And we were told that the band of brothers were supposed to be celibate. And I told y'all he met that girl, Astrid. I don't know if I told you her name is Astrid, but I told you he met this girl that was like studying to be a nun. And I told you he was gonna fuck her. And, I, and uh, right before we got to part three on part two, uh, we, it was revealed that they were fucking married and they had a daughter. So I told y'all, I wanna call y'all bitches. Y'all are my people, you're the people. I told y'all that this man was one gonna fucking smash. I told y'all it was weird. He was comparing everything to fucking when he was supposed to be a celibate man. But at the same time, I told y'all there was gonna be a female silver saint. Now, we don't know that his daughter, who he named Patience, which is like, it's giving white Southern Christian vibes, naming her child Patience, but I digress. Um, we don't know for sure that Patience is a silver saint. But we know that Patience exists and I am still waiting for this man to die. Like, I've never, I don't think, I've not read a Patrick Rothfuss book, but I think that telling a trilogy and the style that this man is telling the story, I, in each, I don't know, I want the, I want Gabriel to die. Cause I do think that that, the whole purpose of him telling the story is for it to be recorded so that we can just kill him. And I don't think the, the way that he is running through the story, I don't see a reason for him to survive. So I think that he's either going to die or he's going to become an actual like vampire. I don't know if you can go from Silver Saint to vampire, and I don't know if they really want him to be a vampire considering he killed the Forever King. But if he hadn't killed the Forever King, then Homegirl couldn't become the, the, the queen that she is today. So I'm just saying, he did you a little bit of a favor because your ass was never going to be a queen. Because <laughs> it's not like, you know, a human. That man was never going to die. So he kind of did you a favor. I don't know. Um, I do want to see if Patience is going to be a bigger part of the story going forward. For a minute, I thought that maybe um, as part of, in part two, we got to meet this like band of characters that we, some one of them, Chloe, was also at the little nun school, but she was traveling with this group of people in search of the Holy Grail, which is giving very 
Robert Langdon vibes. It's giving very Dan Brown. Like, it really is like Jay Kristoff looked at all the popular books. And he just and threw them all in the blender and went, now we have Empire the Vampire. Like, that's really what it feels like. It really feels like this man just cherry picked some really fun ideas that other authors had like thrown out there that they had toyed around with. And Jerry Kristoff said, what if I take Renesme? What if I take this like French society from Serpent and Dove? What if I take this Robert Langdon, like the Holy Grail exists? What if I take this and I blend it up, and I rename some things, uh, <laughs> and I rename some things, and call it a day. That's the vibe I'm getting. So maybe that's a little incorrect, but that's what I'm getting. And I will say, I said this last night, and Aaron was trying to get me to DNF. I think that the Jay Kristoff's writing style is very serviceable. Like, it, there's nothing to write home about it. I do stand by the fact that this man, the, the audiobook is not the way to go for this. Because I know that when Monet was reading, she told us that she had to restart the audiobook several times. And I agree. Because I think that this man has, like, his voice is just for me. For me personally. And for the headphones that I use, my little power beat. His voice is, it's too bass heavy. Then we have accents. It's just, it. my brain can't handle all that. You can't have all that and then me speed you up. So when I was reading it physically, I was definitely able to get through it faster, but I don't think I'm going to escape the audiobook entirely because most of the time that I find myself reading is when I'm at work and I'm like doing like the little cleanup process so I can go home. And then when I get home, I'm like, I, I need a break. I need to decompress because this isn't a fun world to live in. Like it's very, I still don't understand how society is functioning. Like I know that there have been cataclysms throughout our like regular degular history without vampires and shit and humans found a way to soldier on and other animals found a way to soldier on. But I'm not, like I don't fully understand this forever night situation. Because the sun still exists, and the sun is still rising, but it's not killing vampires in the daytime, but it's not also completely dark. So, like, I don't know. And, like, not every, like, some plants are still growing, but other plants aren't growing. And I'm not a botanist. I told you all I was going to do some, like, research and watch some YouTubes. Like, mushrooms, okay, but other things, like, root vegetables, I feel like root vegetables still need, like, sun exposure. Like, I don't know. I don't know. I also don't know if you can live for 27 years on fucking potatoes and mushrooms. I don't know. I don't know. And I also don't know that if the world were ending and all we had to eat were potatoes and fucking mushrooms, I would bother trying to make, I guess you would still need alcohol for like cleaning purposes, but like making just batches of vodkas to have in my little pub would not be at the top of my to-do list. So that's also weird in my opinion, but they didn't ask me. And so, like, that part of the world, I still don't really understand. The supernatural things, like, the character things, fine, whatever. Nothing to write home about whatsoever. But that's just where I'm at. I'll check in when I've read some more. I'm 46 of the way. 46 of the way. 46% of the way through Empire the Vampire. And I have to say... One, today's been very productive. I made some more chili because it's all like gray and rainy out and I made some bread. So I have some bread to look forward to when I get home. <sighs> but this book, this book. So in order to really discuss this moment, we have to go back in time a little bit to like, I think this was happening in part three. In part three, I think is when we went back to the little... Silver Saint Academy or whatever. And there we had like a falling star moment. And we were told that, oh, you know, back in the backwoods country, 
when a star falls, it's like a saint falling to earth or whatever, like an angel's falling to earth. And at the time, I didn't think anything of it. And then, you know, I kept listening and we're listening and we're, we left the little academy again and we're back with Chloe and the ragtag group of people. Um, and they're traveling, trying to figure out what they're going to do on the search for the holy fucking grail. Okay, sure. And then, and then we get, <laughs> they're fighting off like an army of wretched, which are like half rotted people who have come back to life. They don't really, they're like, they're technically vampires, but they're like the low vampire. And who pops up but Jesus fucking Christ. Now in this, his name is Dior. So Dior is Jesus fucking Christ. And when I, I had the realization like five seconds before and I was like, there's no way. There's no way in this book featuring French Catholics are we actually going to get Jesus fucking Christ. And I will say that like, even before we got the like Dior was Christ, I was already thinking that like, I think it is in, uh, I think it is the Da Vinci Code that is like the Jesus Robert Langdon, which I already talked about how Jay Kristoff was already out here cherry picking popular bestsellers to craft his little universe or whatever. But I think it is an, it might be Angels and Demons, it might be, um, the Da Vinci Code where we're like looking for, or the Jesus Christ is like involved in the plot line. And in there, it was revealed that the Holy Grail wasn't so much the cup. It was Jesus's descendants. And I feel like we're going to do something very similar here. I feel like the Holy Grail isn't actually going to be this chalice. I feel that Dior is actually the Holy Grail. And I feel like Dior... Here's the thing, that we know that at the beginning of the book is like the end of the story where Gabriel has been captured. They've killed the Forever King. Um, and we know that the Grail is lost. And Gabriel thinks that the Pale Empress wants to know where the grail is because if the grail does exist it's like gonna end them right and so reading this I'm I feel as though Dior dies somewhere along Gabriel's journey um and the vampires are going to like win the day mayhaps but it also depends on the structures of books two and three which I will also say that before I actually placed Order, I didn't realize that this was another goddamn trilogy. I definitely thought Empire of the Vampire was a standalone book. I feel like when it was first uploaded on Goodreads, it was just one book. And now there's like a trilogy situation. I don't know if I need three books. I really, truly don't. I feel like we'll see, we'll see. But I will also say that this book is getting much better probably because I like Dior. I think that he has like interesting. I, I think I think he's interesting because the historian that's like capturing the story, the person that Gabriel is telling the story to, uh, Jean Francis. I like Jean Francis. He be having the quips and the, the little moments that like you can't hate him because he's not present in the story enough to hate him. So I like Jean Francis. And Dior gives Jean Francis vibes, which I'm not sure um, Dior would appreciate because he is not fucking with Gabriel at all. He is like, you drink blood, then drink blood, you're a holy abomination, which is interesting because you would think that the, the Jesus, an angel, a saint, the, the grail would be a little bit more forgiving of that. Um, but no, he is not fucking with the silver saints. Which is, again, it's an interesting little commentary. I don't think Dre Kristoff is going to do anything with it. I continue to think that Dre Kristoff is not the best author. I think that his, like, books are very... I don't know. Maybe this is just a problem that I'm having with adult fantasy authors. But I think that YA fantasy, however... 
people want to drag it, however people want to come for it. I think that they, on a, just like a creative writing level, are better executioners of the world. Because I'm still, I still have issues picturing whatever is happening in this little situation ship we got going on. But I also think that they, I don't know, there's something about them that I enjoy more. And I think that like adult fantasy for whatever reason, a lot of these people, or maybe it's just the white men I've been reading recently, like they don't seem to have any care for any of the locations that their scenes take place in. It's more about this fight is happening and less about like literally anything that's happening in the world. Um, making the world feel vibrant and alive is like not at all on their to-do list, which I think is very odd if you are creating a fantasy world. I don't think that, maybe it's just because I really didn't like The Way of Kings, but I didn't feel like those descriptions really landed. And I don't think that these descriptions really are hitting. Because in my eyes, I don't understand like why we have all of these descriptions of people's eyes having to adjust to the darkness when they live in like, I don't wanna say they don't, they don't live in complete darkness. So I understand that much. But the sun is being like equivocated to candlelight and candlelight really isn't like, you know, the greatest, especially when they apparently have chemical lights as well. I don't know what that means. I guess it's a little bit brighter, but still it's just like, I don't, what is there to adjust to? Like when you kind of all live in a state of semi-darkness, I don't think your eyes would really be doing too much adjusting. I just want to say that I was right. I don't know how early in the vlog I called it. I know that I, I was definitely thinking it pretty early on that Dre Kristoff was really reaching into a grab bag of popular plot structures, plot ideas, and just throwing them in a blender and giving them to us. I am going to say I am kind of, I'm kind of fucking with it. I'm kind of fucking with it. For a really long time, like, mm, up until like the 38% mark, like maybe 40% of the book, I was just kind of like, this is, this is kind of a hot mess. And even up until like the Jesus reveal, like the Robert Langdon Da Vinci Code plot ripoff moment, I was still kind of like, maybe this isn't, Maybe this is not the move. This isn't like something I'm fucking with. But the more that I read, the better time I'm having. So like, I'm kind of sitting in like a, a three, dare I say a four. Um, I still don't think that there is a lot here to give me a trilogy with. Like, this is, this is the thing, right? So I understand that when an author sells a book, they might only sell like one book. And then they'll like see what happens. Maybe they'll get like a two book deal like after that, right? Or like you'll sell two books and then you'll be like, I think it was when I was reading the, uh, when I reread Leviathan Wakes, there was like an author's note and it was talking about how James S.A. Corey originally sold like three books in that series, right? They were contracted for three books. And now obviously there are eight, about to be nine books in the expanse. But I even think when you read Leviathan Wakes, there's a lot of stuff that is clearly set up. Like clearly these things aren't being answered. And I think with Empire of the Vampire, it's not even that things aren't being answered. It's that to me, things are being telegraphed so clearly. Like the whole, we're gonna steal. <laughs> like to me, the whole, we're gonna steal um, the Descendants of Jesus plotline from the Da Vinci Code or whatever, um, was telegraphed super far in advance. The, um, Gabriel was gonna have sex and was gonna, like, have a child was telegraphed the moment we learned that the Silver Saints don't fuck and the Silver Saints definitely don't reproduce. So it's not like, oh, all of these things I have no answers for. It's more like, I saw all of these twists and turns coming. Like, I kind of predicted you were gonna do that because you told me that those things never happen. 
And so as soon as, to me in a book, as soon as you tell the reader that this thing is a thing that never happens, eight times out of 10, eight times out of nine, really, like that is the thing that happens. Like that's gonna be the reason. Like the reason that we read most books, especially in fantasy, is because the 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 protagonist is a super special person. We don't read a fa like fantasy. I'm sure exists where we don't follow like a chosen one, a super special person. But most fantasy, we are following a character, especially here where it's very obvious that Gabriel was super special and we learned that he was like a, a frail blood, but then he was doing this shit and taking down all these super ancient vampires single-handedly by himself. Like, it's very obvious that in most fantasy, we're following a special character who can do special things, and that's part of what makes the story interesting. And so here though, like I wish we were getting more like, oh, I can't wait to see where that goes. And even here, I feel like, unless there is a massive cliffhanger, which case I'm gonna call it out. Anytime a book ends on, like even fucking uh, House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J. Mass, a book that I gave like two stars to, I wanna say maybe three, um, but I feel like it was definitely two. Um, that book reads like a standalone and then there's like this tacked on epilogue where it's like okay well I guess we're gonna have to explore that part now and this reads very much the same it's like everything is nice and tied up and, and then there's probably gonna be an epilogue where it's like here we go and even the way of kings it was such a self-contained story that that one really I know I, I feel like I have this criticism a lot of a lot of books where I say that it felt like a writing exercise but the way of kings really felt like a writing exercise in that I there there is clear setup for future things to happen but it also is very very self-contained almost dare I say like I said a standalone quality so I don't know if I want to continue with Empire of the Vampire, but I am going to say that the more time I spend listening to the audiobook, the more time I'm enjoying it. Um, I also think that the more time that I read about these like vampire fights, I think that the better Jay Kristoff is getting. I definitely think that a lot of the earlier con like confrontations that he was having with the vampires, it wasn't that Gabriel was besting them easily, but I, I wasn't invested didn't care and even now I'm not so invested because we know that Gabriel at least survives to a point to where he can kill the forever king and tell the story to Jean Francis and so if he hasn't made it to the point where he's telling the story to Jean Francis then I'm not so much worried for his safety but I think that's why he is traveling in a group I do think that's why he's in a group so that Jerry Kristoff could deliver character deaths and make you feel like the stakes were being raised even though you understand that Gabriel is safe. Which I also think is a, an odd choice to make narratively where we have to know that our protagonist is in these like die. And like, that's another thing where Jay Kristoff, I, I do think he shot himself in the foot a little bit, a tiny bit, because we know that um, Gabriel in the situation where I'm reading now is like, there's really no reason for him to have survived the thing that he is surviving, but he has to survive to get to the point where he can tell the story. And I kind of felt the same way to bring up the way, because again, where it wasn't even that Kaladin was telling us the story, but it's like in the first hundred pages, Kaladin survives death 87 times. And so when you're in the middle of the book and shit is hitting the fan, it's like, okay, but he survived 87 times. It's possible the 88th could take him out, but it's very unlikely. You know, I'm not gonna hold my breath on that one. I'm, I'm just not. So that's where I'm at with that. So love that for the culture. Hate it a little bit for me. I haven't hit 75%. And I said that I was gonna come back at 75%. But some fuck shit has been happening, and I feel the need to comment on it. So, without getting any spoilers, I feel like there was a 
a moment with what I was talking about earlier from the plot line that he done snatched out of a Robert Langdon novel that I didn't think was executed the best. I will say that it was like part Ariana Grande reference, part Mulan, and it just, the way it was executed, um, I don't know if I like it. Don't know, don't know if I think that it was executed well at all. But I was like, whatever, I'm gonna keep going. Then we get to part five, so we're going back in time again. So the whole Mulan, Ariana Grande reference was in part four. Part five, we're back at the little Catholic elite order. He's like 16, 17 years old, training to do what he do. Bullshit. Hate that for the culture. Hate that for like literally everybody. Part of this chapter that I'm reading has some very intense homophobia in it. And I just would like to ask why. I don't understand, one, homophobia and fantasy, point blank, period, at all, end of sentence. It bothered me in the Greenbone Saga. It's bothering me here. Like, I don't care what culture, what little situation they want to base it on. Homophobia and fantasy is just very boring to me. I don't think that it's interesting at all through, like, any stretch of the imagination. I think it's just boring. I don't think it adds anything ever. But here, it's like, why, why go through all this effort to reinvent Catholicism, to reinvent Catholic France, to reinvent all of this bullshit on this planet we're calling Earth, but the continents and country boundaries are vastly different, to then just be like, and homophobia still exists. I also just want to say that um, spit is not lube. Spit is not lube. So these men out here spitting in their palms, like what? What? So like not only are they going to have like sex, but the sex is about to be uncomfortable and not good for them. For what? Like why? 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 That's what I want to know. I would love to know what was going through Jay Kristoff's mind when he was writing this scene. I would love to, like, ask him why he felt it was necessary to include homophobia in this religious order. Because the Catholic Church, Christianity, has been involved in a lot of sins. So when he was crafting this little fantastical France, right, fantastical Catholic France, he said these Catholic French people would be 100% against homophobia. Like, there would be no gays allowed, sodomy is a sin, yada, yada, yada. But he didn't, like, import... And I'm not going to be like, oh, if you're going to import homophobia, you should import the racism. But, like, Catholic France, they had slaves too. They fucked over Haiti. Look at Haiti. Haiti is still struggling because of Catholic France. So, for me... For me, I just would love to know the thought process of when you're recreating a religion, why import homophobia and not import the racism? Now, Jay Kristoff was already a racist, so I can understand him not wanting to, like, reach into the grab bag, have even more people come for him, but it's like, they're kind of part and parcel. You know, if you're using the, if you're using your Bible to justify homophobia, you're using the Bible to justify racism. You're using the Bible to justify all kinds of bigotry. And it's not that I want to read about the bigotry, but I feel like this weird foolishness is just foolishness. And it's it's also like Gabriel as a narrator is already dealing with a whole bunch of fuck shit. One, I think that he's the wrong choice to narrate the story based on a plot twist. Not plot twist, but that revelation that we got in part four with the Robert Langdon book plot line that he done ripped off and stole and put in his little vampire situation so I think that Gabriel's already the incorrect narrator but it's like Gabriel is already out here committing all kinds like everybody in this holy order is committing all kinds of sins and Gabriel is kind of judging him for it but it's like the way that the homophobia is in the book I'm just like I want something more you know like I want something more I just want to be able 
it would just be really nice to open up a fantasy book and not be slapped by bigotry. That's really all I want in life. And I don't think that's asking too much. Clearly it is because I can't seem to find it. Well, let me say it. Well, no, I am going to say it. I can't seem to find it. Like even I'm sure that queer normative fantasy for adults exists and I haven't read it yet, but it's just like there has to be more to life than this you know like there has to be a situation where we could just stop with it and I would like to see that situation I would like to live in the world where I ain't gotta read the book and I'm getting attacked by homophobia getting attacked by description of characters that feel three sentences away from a slur I want to live in that world that's where I want to be, but I am home, so I'm going to go eat some lunch, catch up on my shows, live my life a little. I'll check in closer to the 75% point, but I just really needed to, to come in here and vent about that because I couldn't vent about the plot twist situation. Um, that was like the little razzle-dazzle that, that uh, fucking, what is this man's name? Jay Kristoff, his little razzle-dazzle he added to make his little Robert Langdon plotline original. Y'all, I have done the thing. I have finished this brick of a book. And I have to say that um, this has been a wild ride. I'm going to leave a link to... It wasn't intended to be a Twitter thread, but it became a Twitter thread. So I'll leave a link to the Twitter thread where I covered some of the thoughts that I was having between the 39% mark and the end of the book. So some of the stuff you'll have already heard me talk about and then some of the things I didn't touch on. Um, and I find this like really hard to rate. I think that Monet from Life is Monet gave this like three and a half stars. And if I was a half star person, I could get with that. So I'm gonna have to round this one way or another and I haven't decided if I'm gonna go three or four yet, but the book definitely turned around. I think that like once I just accepted this hodgepodge of plots that Jay Kristoff was going to write, um, it became better. But I really don't like how the book ends at all whatsoever. I don't, I, and I also really don't like how the book is structured. The way that John Francis was like out here trying to get the story just didn't make any sense. I feel like there were definite holes in the story and I never and I said this in one of my updates I just never believed that Gabriel was telling the whole truth it was kind of like when we had this scene of them do, out on a hunt when he was like 16 or so and no was it when it, it was when um it was when he and Chloe and all of them were together and they had their backs against the the wall or whatever early on in the book and so he was like 32 and he told them that the like eastern hallway was what they'd rigged and then over the course of the story he was actually rigging the western hallway or something and so that's the hallway that went up in flames and jean francis was like um you're lying because you said this and he was like yeah but that's what i needed them to know because y'all be pushing into our minds and i think that like some of the story that he was telling just wasn't true and i also think that this was just a weird story to follow from Gabriel's perspective, mostly because, well, spoiler alert, we don't even get to see him murder the Forever King. So we don't see him murder the Forever King, and the book ends with him trying to murder Jean Francis, and Jean Francis, like, escaping death, and, like, there were, like, rats in his coat. It didn't make any sense. That's why I didn't like the ending. Um, I felt that the before that, the book ended, like, on this really interesting note where they were going to sacrifice Dior, who was revealed to be the super special, you know, God incarnate. And I felt that, that was stronger. And then we, we had this scene of him talking to Jean Francis. So I feel like I would have just cut that chapter of him talking to Jean Francis and then ended with the last chapter that's like called Dawn. It's not even a chapter, it's like a little page. And that was fine. But even just like other parts in the story I felt were odd. I felt that the pacing was also odd in that we would jump back and forth between the past and the present and then as the book went on 
we had fewer and fewer interjections from Jean Francis, and that was kind of sad because I liked him, but I could also understand why, because Jean Francis and Dior have, like, very similar personalities, and they were very similar characters. Um, it was just weird. It was weird, but I, I kind of liked it. I don't know. It's very strange. Again, I don't think this is, like... I've seen some people say that Jay Kristoff has, like, really flowery writing in this book, and I would hard disagree. I would also say that, like, I think that the marketing of this, like, cover, at least this cover, I think is more, um, well, I guess, like, actually all of the same animals are on the U.S. cover. They're just in blood, which makes sense when you're reading the story. But this one and then like the illustrations go a long way to like providing an aesthetic but I almost feel like the illustrations were included because Jay Kristoff doesn't actually describe things and so it's hard for me to be like oh this book heavily relies on like the writing and the aesthetic because I don't think it does it's very it's very much like I've already said it's a Brandon Sanderson a Robert Jordan it's not quite on a Robert Jordan level or a Brandon Sanderson level it's like maybe if they're the base floor, then he's, like, on the second staircase. Not second staircase, but, like, on the second stair. So, like, it's a, it's a tad up. But, again, a lot of that has to do with the illustrations. So, I don't really know if I would agree with that part. But, like, and you, and I do think that you have to be willing to, to just go with the absurdity of what is happening. Which makes sense because it is a fantasy novel. So, clearly, there's going to be a little bit more suspension of disbelief required but even then I think it requires slightly more than even other fantasies because you have to like the idea that he's telling all of the story in a single night I don't know if I'd believe that <laughs> I, I don't and the way that the story jumps back and forth is just a little it's a little weird like sometimes he tells things out of order because it makes sense to tell things out of order it's like okay it told you this part but now we have to like tell you this other part to clarify but other times it's like we're out of order just so gabriel could fuck around with john francis and get john francis upset with him and like get under his skin a little bit and i don't know how necessary that was to the reader i don't think that really improved my experience overall it's definitely not a five-star book and i definitely think that the book ends i, I understand why it isn't a standalone but it, it could have been. Like, it gets so close to the line of, like, being a standalone that you can kind of see that by the time I got to page, like, 600, I could under not even 600, like, 550, I would say. By 550, I think, is really when Jay Kristoff started to weave in the fact that he wasn't going to be able to wrap up the story, which I felt was a little bit late in the game. I don't think that there was enough established in the first half of the book for this to be a series. I think that... The first half of the book really wrote like Jay Kristoff sat down to write a standalone. And then when he got to, you know, page 600, he was kind of like, okay, well, let me introduce some series potential. And I also don't think that this reads like a, I don't, sometimes I think you can read a book and be like, okay, yeah, this sold as a standalone. And then they bought more because like the first book is pretty solid, but I don't imagine any publishing house buying this book thinking it was going to stand alone because you get practically no answers to any of the major questions of the story like there are a lot of questions that have to do with Gabriel that get like literally no answers like you you don't get anything <laughs> answered from Gabriel a lot of the questions that you get answered are in relations to Dior and how she is like God incarnate um with her little Mulan transformation moment not transformation moment but like revelation moment and it's it was just weird like, we get a lot of answers with her, but then even at the end, there's, like, a couple of questions, and it's like, okay, I would like some answers here. I don't know when the next book in the series is supposed to be out. I don't know anything about it. I do think that I'm curious enough to pick it up. Um, I do think I'm, I'm curious enough for that. I do want to say, because I did bring it up in one of my car clips of the fantasy homophobia... I did appreciate that we circled back to them and they seem to be thriving in the little fortress that they built. But I also want to say that I think that a lot of the religious elements in this don't make a lot of sense. I'm just going to say it. I, I've said it before, I, but I ended the book thinking the same way that I don't, 
part of me understands that you would have religious elements in a book about vampires. I think that especially for the kind of vibe and aesthetic that Jay Kristoff was going for, it makes sense for the religiosity to be such a central component. But I don't think that one, I don't understand the like the fantasy elements that he tried to introduce to it because I don't think that he really did um anything with it he just kind of renamed things like instead of Jesus dying on a cross I guess he just got like stretched out on a wheel um like I said he he completely took a plot line from the da Vinci code in relation to Dior so it's like he didn't do anything with the religion but I I found it weird that the silver saints seem to like hold so tightly to this idea of the of their homophobia being a core tenet of their faith when it didn't seem necessary like it seemed like it was another thing that Jerry Kristoff wanted to happen where uh Gabriel De Leon and Dior would have their back against the wall and they would have to like seek shelter and so we're gonna have them here. I also want to say that they keep calling Gabriel the last of the Silver Saints, but the book ends with the Silver Saints being, like, they have been, he didn't slaughter all of the Silver Saints, and Aaron definitely still exists at the end of this book, so how Gabriel became the last of the Silver Saints also isn't answered, because <laughs> what? I guess it's just too much, I guess, but we definitely know that he is alive, so we know that book two he has at least one silver saint ally who he's aware of that he trusts um so the gays had a happy ending for now but i'm still holding my i'm not gonna hold my breath because literally every other side character that we met um died and then when we realized they weren't dead was murdered by gabriel so i don't know I don't quite know how to rate this and I don't quite know if this is like worth everyone's time especially for how long it is how long like this book is gigantic I say that but it is also only like barely 700 pages so you can get through it and the font at least in this copy that I hate is fairly large it's not it, it definitely is the same size as most YA um it's just maybe it's like a one and a half it's like 1.2 line spacing instead of like one and a half line spacing but it's not like it's the longest book in the world it's definitely you can get through it the writing I think is approachable um I just wish I understood why he decided to do fantasy France that fucks because I don't understand it I also want to say that um <laughs> the sex scenes in this were a little bit awkward um, I talked about the one earlier, but then we also got a sex scene between Gabriel and his love interest, Astrid, who I want to say was done dirty. I'm going to say it. I also, I want to, I do want to talk about that because <sighs> what the narrative did to Astrid, I thought it was a little bit, at first I was really liking her and I liked her all the way up until the point where, like, I, I feel like a part of me definitely knew that that's what happened to her, but the way that... The, Jay Kristoff just used that as motivation in 2020. I I just don't understand why. It's very like it why, sir? Do we do we need to do that? It's just like there are so many conversations around what like that specific trope that I just I don't understand why you would choose to do that to somebody in 2020. Like I know it's 2021. But he, this book was originally public, like scheduled to be published last year, and then it got pushed. So really, like 2019, this man had so much time to like not use that as motivation, and then he did it. And I just, and even to patience, he did the same thing with patience. So I guess I was one of my predictions about patience being important to the narrative. I mean, technically, it was correct in that she was important to the narrative. She just wasn't important in the way that I expected her to be or a way that I would have wanted her to be. So that was unfortunate. I hate that for the culture. I hate that for patience. I hate that for Astrid. Um, but like I said, the book does end in a way where I'm curious. I would want answers, but I also wouldn't go out of my way to recommend this to people. Like, I think it's solid. Like, the story is solid, but I would also, if this does interest you and you wanted to read a Jerry Kristoff, I think that because of the way this book ends, I would probably tell people to wait 
until the entire thing is out. Like, however many books this winds up being, I don't think it's ever written more than a trilogy. I think this is planned to be a trilogy, according to Goodreads and the people on the internet. Because even with a book two, I'm not expecting answers at this point. I would expect for him to just continue to give me a bunch of things that I find interesting and like a little bit compelling and that he's probably stolen from other popular books. Um, but I think that book three is where I'm going to get the most answers that I'm going to get. And I think that most readers would be satisfied having the entire arc. I think that this is very unsatisfying. I know that there are people who have already given this five stars on Goodreads or whatever. So clearly people who find this satisfying exist. For me, I don't think it's satisfying. And I don't think it's, um, even like as a first book, I don't think it's like, oh, well, at least I got some answers because like I said we really didn't get any answers to anything here um just a lot of questions and just a lot of possibilities I don't know so that's where I ended my thoughts on Empire of the Vampire um it was a wild ride for sure but um now I have to go find room for this on my shelf I don't know where that's gonna fit but I'm gonna have to find some room so if you made it to the end of the video, let me know down below in the comments if you were going to read this, if you have read it. If you don't have anything to say, we can drop this lovely emoji down there instead. And I'll see you guys again soon with another video. But until then, and until next time.